Hey, it's Mazzy. I'm talking about jazz. I want to talk about live jazz artists I was fortunate enough to see, mostly in the 1970s. Now, let's dive in. I went through my archive, and I don't have a list of all the shows I have. I went through uh, several clubs of uh, live shows, and the main club I went to see live jazz music in the 1970s was the Keystone Corner. It was a small club in North Beach, right where North Beach and Chinatown intersect in San Francisco on Vallejo Street, just across the alley from a police station, the uh, Chinatown North Beach uh, Police Station in San Francisco. And Todd Barkin opened the club in 1972. It closed in uh, 1983. He had a tempestuous time keeping it afloat. They had to raise money for a liquor license and so on. And it was a tiny club, but I saw so many of these great, great jazz musicians. Now, Todd Barkin originally conceived it to be a sort of a psychedelic jazz club, whatever the fuck that means. Uh, and it never became a psychedelic jazz club, really. He called it the Keystone Corner. It had been a blues club uh, prior to that with some of the San Francisco rock and blues acts playing there. And occasionally they would play there over the years before and after it was a jazz club. And they called it the Keystone Corner because of the Keystone Cop, since it was literally across on the alley from uh, the uh, police station there. And I saw so many uh, great artists there. It was a perfect time for me being in like from my in my all through my 20s, basically seeing all these great artists into my 30s. So it was a wonderful time to learn about jazz, to see all these legacy amazing jazz artist for five, six, seven dollars. And, and what would happen is sometimes he'd have, you know, artists play two or three nights and sometimes they would do a week long uh, date and they'd arrive on Sunday and um, sometimes they'd start Monday nights, and but through the week they would play. And then sometimes on Sunday afternoon, some of the same artists would go down and play these Sunday afternoon gigs right across from the Pacific Ocean uh, in Miramar, right before Half Moon Bay, about 35 uh, minutes south of San Francisco at the Bach Dynamite Beach House. Uh, it's a longer name, and I'm uh, paraphrasing the name. And I saw some of these great artists there as well. And it, at first, it was very loose. It was this beach house with a balcony, piano in it. You'd go in the refrigerator, grab a beer, and just hang out. Donations uh, would be for the artists. There weren't always a chargeable entry fee. I think later it changed and it's still around to this day, but it's a cool, uh, a cool, uh, just loose venue. But when it was sort of unknown or, or, or unknown to not really famous, it was really cool because you could just go down there and uh, have a great time in South San Francisco. So we would do that Sunday afternoons, go to the Miramar Beach and have brunch and then uh, go to this uh, festival. So I went through my collection. The records I'm going to show here are not necessarily, in fact, none of them are really the live albums of the times I saw them. In fact, many times there were no live albums made of these uh, dates that I went to. But I want to just showcase these artists, and I just picked a random record. Obviously, sometimes they're 10, 20 years off from when I saw the record or more. But I just want to give you an idea. And again, it was the timing the the fortunate uh, interest in music. Uh, my friend uh, Jashit Brooks, who uh, was my college roommate, we he turned me on to a lot of jazz, so we went to see all these great jazz artists. The first one I have to show is obviously Miles Davis, and this is Live Evil from, Evil from 1971. I saw him, it was either 70, I think it's 1973, at Stanford University at Frost Amphitheater. I wanted to see him but he wasn't the headliner. In a way, I was going to see the new riders of the Purple Sage that sort of, you know, connected to the Grateful Dead country rock band. Jerry Garcia a lot of times would show up and play, but Miles Davis opened up for the new riders of the Purple Sage. How bizarre is that? And he was doing this really electronic, wild, uh, with a tabla player and interesting. I don't remember the exact band he had and I took some pictures, which I may uh, stick at the end of this uh, video, but um, it wasn't with this lineup, but it was great. But he played one, what, 45, 50 minute piece of music intertwined. And someone recently sent me a link 
uh, to Stanford University to a live, basically, recording of that show. And I hadn't heard it since I saw the show in 1973. So that was my only time to see Miles Davis. Then, these, again, are not in order, but I just want to showcase the artists. And again, uh, I feel fortunate at seeing them. Earl Father Hines, what a great piano player. Now, I got into him around 1975-76 because of the Ry Cooter album, Paradise and Lunch. The last song on that is called Diddy Wah Diddy, and it's just Ry Cooter on acoustic guitar and Earl Father Hines on this great jazz piano. He's older than some of these artists, and he was, um, you know, a late, he came about in the 40s, 50s, and made some amazing music, even, I think, as much as the late, uh, 30s maybe. This is a recording from 1966 on um, Impulse and this is a fantastic record. This is 1966 recording Once Upon a Time. The great Earl Father Hines, Earl Hines. When I was at San Francisco State in the broadcasting radio audio department, I worked on a project for KQED uh, radio uh, that did a jazz series and we did these live dates and I would uh, kind of work as a PA on setting up. So we went to the College of Marin and we recorded a, a live gig. Uh, we broadcasted of Earl Father Hines and I was able to hang out and meet him. And uh, what a great man. It was him solo and really great. So Earl Father Hines. Now, probably the artist I saw a lot, and I'm not quite sure exactly why I saw him so many times, but it's the great drummer Art Blakey. Obviously, I didn't see him around the time of this classic album, Monin, probably his most popular album with the Jazz Messengers. He was like a great talent scout of young artists, new artists, in the vein of uh, Miles Davis, who brought the, the various uh, quintets, uh, like John Mayall, who had those great British blues guitars, like Eric Clapton and, and Peter Green. What a great album. This just represents, I think I saw him probably three or four times, and what a powerhouse. Remember, Keystone Corner was a tiny club, so his drumming, uh, Someone I have I really didn't think to pull. Also, the other drummer that I saw a lot or several times was Elvin Jones around this time too, mid-70s. I'd say most of the shows I saw at the Keystone were from 74 through 79 into 80, 81. Uh, but uh, what a great album. And it was wonderful to see Art Blakey. What a, again, an amazing drummer that you all know. I probably saw Dexter Gordon three or four times at uh, the Keystone Corner. Remember, this was a time when he was on Columbia Records. Of course, this is our man in Paris, a fantastic Blue Note record, Music Matters Jazz uh, version of it. A wonderful, wonderful record. And he w he's a tall man. He was a tall man. Of course, uh, later he would act in Round Midnight and several other films but uh, a great, a great saxophone player. And when he would play at the end of each piece, he would literally hold his saxophone out almost as an offering to the audience and a, a show of appreciation. But um, Our Man in Paris, this is an, again, an earlier album. This is from 1963 with Bud Powell, Pierre Michelot, and Kenny Clark on drums during that whole uh, expatriate uh, scene when these great jazz artists, you know, the thing about it, the 70s, it was a really weird time to see these people, although most of these people played true to the classic jazz sound. Of course, this was a time when some jazz artists reinvented themselves, funk was happening, soul jazz was happening, you know, artists like Donald Byrd, who I don't have here, but I did see Donald Byrd was doing the Blackbirds and the soul jazz stuff, and some jazz purists really didn't feel that was the pure jazz, and you know, fusion was happening then too, but that's why I feel it was great at the Keystone Corner. You know, there was some fusion and some uh, artists doing that there, but mostly they were getting into the other kinds of clubs as well. An artist who I saw several times, probably twice, I don't think three times, but it's McCoy Tyner. This is a real McCoy. This is uh, from 1967, but of course I saw him around 76, 77. I saw him a couple times and we used to refer him to as the Led Zeppelin of piano playing because he had this powerful, powerful uh, just presence and and his playing style was very heavy at that period of time. And, and it would be loud and I mean, there'd be subtleties too, but of course, uh, you know, McCoy Tyner came, comes out of uh, Coltrane's band. So that connection obviously I was too young to ever see John Coltrane, unfortunately, but um, 
this is one of those connections I have, you know, six degrees of separation to John Coltrane. An artist I saw a lot, uh, and I love the vibes, is Bobby Hutcherson. Uh, this is The Kicker, uh, 1963. Again, on Blue Note, this is a Mus Music Matters Jazz Edition. Fantastic record. I am a fan of vibes. Some people don't like vibes and just don't like that feel, but Bobby Hutcherson at that period lived in the Bay Area, so he would play around the clubs a lot. So I probably saw him five, six times. The great Bobby Hutcherson on vibes. Another artist who was crossing over and doing some sort of uh, soul jazz stuff, and that was Freddie Hubbard. Uh, this is Breaking Point. This is from 1964. Again, another Music Matters Jazz version of this record, but a fantastic record. This one has James Spaulding on alto, Ronnie Matthews piano, Eddie Kahn bass, and Joe Chambers on drums. But I only saw him once, but an incredible uh, trumpet player. Saw him again at the Keystone Corner. I saw this man late in life, late-ish, again, in the late 70s, very late 70s at the Keystone. And he played a week at the Keystone. And I'm just gobsmacked that I saw him. Of course, you know, he would die, what, in 89, I think, give or take, in Paris. And that's the fabulous Chet Baker. I love Chet Baker. I'm one that likes his vocal style, that just really soft speak. Uh, vocal style, that sexy kind of West Coast trumpet sound. To me, one of the most amazing artists. Of course, there's the great Chet Baker Sings, Tone Poet, that it, when it comes back in print, I suggest you get. This is from the box set from Kraft. They did reissue these separately. This is Chet Baker in New York, but it's not a, a live record. And it's got uh, Chet Baker, Johnny Griffin on alto, Al Haig on piano. Paul Chambers on bass, Philly Joe Jones drums. This is 1958. So uh, fantastic. Any any of these craft records are really wonderful. I, I'm pretty much all in on, for the most part, on Chet Baker. But I feel I just made it with Chet Baker. Of course, he'd move back to uh, Paris. He had that great, uh, that interesting documentary, Let's Get Lost, when he's more of a ragged uh, face thing, obviously drug, alcohol issues, drug mostly, but still play beautifully. And seeing him at literally, I don't know, does it hold 150 people at the Keystone Corner? Not even that, probably. Small club, no wonder they weren't making any money. And uh, Todd Barkin oh, had all these fundraisers and things. And, and then, of course, Art Pepper. Uh, this is the rhythm section, meets the rhythm section with the Red Garland. Philly Joe Jones and Paul Chambers, Craft Edition, One You Need to Get. Fantastic record from 1957. I did see him late 70s there too. And again, from the West Coast uh, jazz sound uh, on Contemporary. Love, love that record. There was a reunion of sorts that happened in the late 70s. And I think it was the late 70s and, or was it 80s? Now, see, this is where I have a little brain freeze, but I feel so fortunate to see, I think it was at the Great American Music Hall in San Francisco, a sort of reunion of Getz and Gilberto, Jal Gilberto and Stan Getz, doing sort of a, a, a revisionist or a revision or a reunion or a sequel uh, live of Getz and Gilberto. And I treasure this so much that I was fortunate enough to see uh, Stan Getz only time I saw Stan Getz at that pair, I never saw. He did come around quite a bit other times, but I only saw this Getz and Gilberto thing. Not Astrid, uh, but it was really, really, really a fantastic show. Never saw Duke Ellington, but I did see Ella Fitzgerald probably around this time. And this was at the uh, Venetian Room at the Fairmont Hotel in San Francisco up on Knob Hill. I always wanted to see... Ella Fitzgerald, since I fell in love with her because of Ella in Berlin, when I heard that in my car driving through Golden Gate Park one night at midnight, next morning I opened up the record store I worked with and I pulled a copy of that album. When she did Mac the Knife and How High the Moon, I was gobsmacked. I loved it. So I, Ella in Berlin, is, it holds a special place. And I'm all in on the songbooks with um, Lou, Louis Armstrong and, of course, all the things she did with... Um, 
Duke Ellington. Now, this is a performance. Uh, this is a two-record set produced by Norman Grants. In 73, Norman Grants came back and started Pablo Records. This is great on Pablo Records, produced by Norman Grants. This is live at Montreux Jazz Festival 1968. This is an album. I know everybody's talking about that great box set of the Riverside box set on acoustic sound, which is fabulous that I happen to get from Coffee Dave. I have that set, but this is accessible. This is in reality terms of price. This is, this is something you can get. And this is acoustic sounds version on Verve from 1968 live at the Montreux Jazz Festival in Switzerland. Love this record. It's a gorgeous record. It has Eddie Gomez on bass and Jack DeJanette on drums. Get it, get it, get it. I did see him in 1980 at the Keystone. He did like a week at the No, I saw him three times because I saw him at the Keystone. Then the next day I saw him at the Bach Dynamite down um, in that really intimate setting. And it was, it was so good, so good. The other time I believe was at the Great American Music Hall. I saw when him and Tony Bennett uh, did shows based on this fabulous record. Of course, being the San Franciscan I am, I love Tony Bennett's I Left My Heart in San Francisco, but seeing this wonderful uh, duet of the great Bill Evans and Tony Bennett, it's just, it's mouthwatering. And Helen Keane was his longtime producer manager, produced this, and this was a hit record for fantasy. There was a sequel as well. This record's from 1975, and it's a wonderful record to pick up, more on the pop side of jazz, but just, you know, standard, but really, really beautiful, beautiful record. Waltz of Debbie is on here, the, one of the classic uh, Bill Evans songs, and of course, uh, the great uh, Mancini Mercer Days of Wine and Roses. What a record, what a record, good record. Herbie Hancock is someone I saw several times in various uh, incarnations from his, you know, most of the time I saw him, he was doing uh, more of the electronic stuff, the mixed up. I'm, I'm gonna show this because this is Speak Like a Child. It's one that doesn't get a lot of love here. This is a Music Matters Jazz version. And this is a fantastic record from 1968. So it's got that soul, full funkiness to it that sounds like, uh, you know, the bit of a soundtrack of, of pre-black exploitation films but that really urban, uh, wonderful sound with this beautiful photograph on the cover. And this has Herbie Hancock, Thad Jones, Flugelhorn, Ron Carter, of course, bass, Peter Phillips bass, also bass trombone, Jerry uh, Donji on alto flute and Mickey Roker on drums. And I mean, there's so many great uh, Herbie Hancock records. What a legacy, it's amazing we still have him. I did see some of his funky electronic wild stuff in the 70s. And I want to show this because this is one of the records that I was actually at one of the shows. Uh, this is one time VSOP. They actually did a, several shows. I was at the Greek Theater in uh, Berkeley on the UC uh, Berkeley campus and saw this wonderful show. And basically it's the, it's the second quintet, the great quintet. And instead of Miles, uh, you get Freddie Hubbard. So that would have been the second time I saw Freddie Hubbard then. Didn't think of that before. Freddie Hubbard, Herbie Hancock, Tony Williams, Ron Carter, Wayne Shorter. Of course, they played with Miles those great mid, late 60s years. And this was uh, a, this is a great live album from that period. It was kind of a reunion. This is 77, right, 1977. They did A Night at Berkeley, and they did the San Diego Civic Theater. Great, great record. And I, I feel really fortunate to have gone there. In the late 70s, I was going to see some of the standard jazz things, but I was also seeing some fusion artists like uh, John McLaughlin and others, and of course, I did see um, Mahavishnu Orchestra, which I did not pull here. But the other in that kind of vein was Weather Report. Saw Weather Report once. I saw them around this time, 77, of uh, heavy weather when Jocko was their bass player. Of course, uh, the great Wayne Shorter. What an artist and what a sax player and still alive today and played and really pushed this band. But this was originally Joe Zawinul's uh, unit, and Joe, Joe Zawinul was the leader of, of this and wrote some of these great songs. It opens up with this great original composition by Zawinul, Birdland, which in a way became their theme and their biggest 
radio friendly hit. This is one of those records that we play in the record store with crossover. So people who really weren't into jazz or were looking to access it, it was very accessible. Uh, the great John Hendricks, the uh, blues jazz vocalist from Lambert Hendricks and Ross would write lyrics to this and there would be a vocal version that the Manhattan Transfer uh, did and had somewhat of a hit with as well in the jazz, pop, adult, contemporary uh, charts. But this is a great record. What a fedora on the cover, right? How great is that? Another show I went to, I went to this exact show, and this crosses over from jazz to guitar to flamenco, is Friday night, in San Francisco, uh, the uh, Warfield Theater in San Francisco, Al Miola, who was doing a lot of fusion stuff, obviously, John McLaughlin. I would suggest get my goals beyond. Before he started the whole Mava Vishnu Orchestra electronic thing and, and electric uh, playing with Miles, he did, I think in 71 or 72, an acoustic album, My Goals Beyond, very spiritual, very acoustic, very Ricky-ish, uh, very uh, massage-like. It's a gorgeous record. It's on a division of uh, Columbia, I think. I forgot the label. has a guitar, acoustic guitar on the cover. Uh, My Goals Beyond. Get that record. But this record is beautiful guitar. You know, Impex, uh, this is the all-analog version. They just put out Saturday Night Show. I did not go to the Saturday Night Show. Uh, that sounds great. There is a digital step there. If that going to mess you up, don't let it, because it sounds great. But if you just need one, if you want to just get one, get Friday Night in San Francisco. It, I mean, to me, the hero here and my favorite guitar player of these three is Paco de Lucia. Um, Paco de Lucia. Paco de Lucia. Paco de Lucia. De Lucia is what a player. I have several of his um, kind of, uh, flamenco style. He's more less classical than flamenco, uh, but what a beautiful player. What a gorgeous player. What a gorgeous uh, presentation on this record. So this is a must-have, and it's, I mean, it, it's, it's not the traditional jazz thing, but it's a fantastic record, and it was one of those great shows I saw live. And lastly, I'm going to start out with a record of an artist that I saw only once, at the Monterey Jazz Festival in 1978. And I was fortunate to meet this artist and smoke a joint with this artist in the booth at K-Jazz Radio during a live segment uh, when they're interviewing him. And that's the fabulous Dizzy Gillespie. One of the wonderful founders of Bebop. Uh, Bebop doesn't get, get as much love around here. And this is a fabulous record from Savoy Sessions of DG Days. And it's got like a couple of versions of Caravan. It's got uh, We Love to Boogie, Lady Be Good, The Champ in a Mess School Days. I just love this record and I love Dizzy Gillespie. I was 23 years old and so that's a memory I have uh, for the rest of my life. So this is just a small showcase of some of these amazing jazz artists. I was fortunate enough to see mostly in the 1970s and into the 1980s a bit. But um, thank you for watching and uh, we'll see you next time. Mazzy loves you. Groovy man.